Hello, welcome back. Before I joined Facebook, I was an entrepreneur. I, I used to run the product and the engineering for a small mobile uh, startup. And back then, I was um, very annoyed that every, every month I had to write a check for my infrastructure cost, let alone the engineering effort spent on maintaining all that infrastructure. When we acquired Pars last year, it was like boom, music to my ears. These guys provide the solution that most of you will probably want to, and I had need for back then. So the next speaker is going to introduce us to how Pars can solve problems related to data storage, push notifications, analytics, and so on. Bear Douglas is a developer advocate with Pars. She's a newbie, a fate wise, but she has been uh, very active in an a cappella group that she has set up for Facebook called the Vocal Network. So I'm pretty sure she can deliver some news that are music to your ears. Over to you. Thanks, KP. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks, KP, for the introduction. I'm Bear, and I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about Parse, what it is, and how to get started. You heard a little bit from Ilya in the keynote about some of our announcements today, but we know a lot of you aren't familiar with the product, and you might be left wondering, what exactly is Parse? Well, Parse is a platform that's meant to make building apps easier by taking away all the work around networking, managing servers, dealing with the nuts and bolts of the infrastructure of your app, so you can get straight to the fun part, which is writing your UI, thinking about the experiences your users have in the app, and writing something that makes your app unique. And people recognize that this is something valuable. You can take data that's generated in your app, and without having to know anything about how running servers works, you can take the data that people are generating and store it up into the cloud without having to think about it. And people see the value. They, uh, they know, savings.com knows, that time spent on infrastructure is time that you aren't spending building solutions to delight your users and uniquely position your app in the marketplace. You and your team can be freed up to focus on your users when you use Parse, and that benefits everybody. And for those of you who haven't uh, thought, heard about Parse before and might be wondering, well, how many apps are you really running? The answer is quite a lot. We've got over 260,000 active apps on Parse, and we have almost quadrupled the number of apps on Parse since joining Facebook, which is uh, a pretty impressive growth for us. Now, how many of you have ever developed on Parse before, show of hands. OK, great. So we have a lot of relatively new people in the audience. And this is meant to be an introduction to how Parse works, the different components of the service, and how you can get started today. So for those of you who are more advanced Parse users, you may want to stick around for Brian's talk next, which is about making your Parse app more robust. But for those of you who are interested in getting a more solid overview of what Parse offers, we think of Parse as having three main pillars. We call them Parse Core, which, com which comprises our data storage service, the ability to run code on our servers, uh, ways to manage users, push notifications, and analytics. And we'll talk about all of these in a little bit more detail, starting with Parse Core. How many of you have downloaded the F8 app? A bunch of you? Fantastic. Well, I want you guys to know that the F8 app was written by one engineer a piece for iOS and for Android in approximately two and a half weeks. That's how easy Parse makes it to create an experience like that really, really rapidly. And how do we do it? Parse Core offers you three main things. You can save data to and fetch data from our cloud. You can run custom app code on our servers. And you can easily create and manage user accounts. Most apps will need some concept of a user account. If you ever want to save data that's particular to somebody, or you want to have settings that a user can change and persist across different times logging into your app, you need a concept of users. So Parse manages all of this for you. So how did we do it in the F8 app? This is a screenshot from the F8 app for Android. And you'll notice that there is a list of talks underneath the build track. So what does that look like in Parse? Well, when we want to save something to Parse, we break an object down into a set of key value pairs. So on the left hand, we have title, time, speaker, and a Boolean value is favorite. And these are all the attributes that we want to save about a talk object. So this is the data that we want to think about when we're talking about our talks. 
And so to actually create this in Parse, all you have to do is define a new Parse object, call it talk, set those attributes by putting them in. You'll, you'll notice this looks kind of like a map in Java. And then call talk save in background. Now notice all the work that you're not doing. You're not work worried about writing network tasks. You're not worried about threading. In no point have we add, have to add a worker queue to handle multiple saves going on. All you have to do is call save in background, and Parse takes care of the rest of that for you. Now, this is examples from Android code. And throughout this talk, I'm going to be showing mostly Java and JavaScript. But the APIs will look very, very similar if you're working in iOS or in JavaScript or in, for Android or even for .NET. Save in background will always be called save in background. And the cool thing is, can we switch to my demo? Once you've saved an object to parse successfully, uh, can we switch to the laptop? There is a web UI where you can see all of the data that is currently in your parse app. And we call it the data browser. Guys, can we switch to the laptop, please? Oh, sorry, it's not on the screen down there. Um, great. So this is a live view of all of the data that is in the F8 Developer Conference app. And I can click through and manage here. This is currently live. So I can create a change here and immediately push it to everybody. So you guys might not know this about me, but danger is my middle name. So I'm going to change data live in the middle of F8. And once I click out of here, that is now live. So if you guys open up your F8 app and you reload any talk with my name on it, it'll now call me Bear Danger Douglas, as it should. So you can also browse all of the classes that you have saved here. And you can do great things like lock down class level permissions, or add new classes, or even import data all through the data browser. Now, this is especially handy if you have any people who are working on your app who aren't engineers and you don't necessarily, won't necessarily have access to your code. They can still update data in the data browser for you, and they can still make important updates to your app, like letting everybody know what my real name is. Can we go back to the slides, please? Great. So that's getting data into Parse. How do we get data out of Parse? Well, you can write a query for it. So you can create an object called Parse Query. You let it know which class you're looking to search over. And then you can add some constraints. In this case, we want to only find talks where the track name is equal to build. And then just like calling save in background for a parse object, you call find in background for a parse query. And you can get a list of parse objects back, which we will expect will be all of the talks in the build track. Now, the cool thing here is we've showed you how to do this with general parse objects, but we also support subclassing in iOS and Android. So if you are interested in creating a strongly typed talk class here, you can write a parse query for a talk. And the objects that you'll get back can be used just like any other object that you would have defined in Java. And it's really handy uh, to make everything type safe inside your app. Now, there is a limit on the size of parse objects that you can have. It's 128K. So many of you might need to store larger, larger objects, like say a photo. And you can do that by using a parse file. A parse file can take an input that's either a byte array or an, an, a 64-encoded 64 string. And once you have your data in that format, you can create a parse file, give it a name, and then pass in that data. And just like a parse object, call save in background. Now, the main difference is that there's no way to query over parse files. So what you'll need to do is after you've saved a parse file, you should attach it to an object. So here we have this photo object that is a photo of one of our speakers. So then we can create the parse object speaker, attach it to attach the photo file to the parse object, and save the parse object in background. Now we can search for speaker, and we can search for speaker based on any data that is stored on the speaker object and get that photo file back really easily. And you'll see that it appears in the data browser with a little uh, oval around it to let you know that that's a file. Great thing about the data browser, too, is that if you double click on that space or in any column that's marked file, it'll bring up a file picker on your computer, and you can upload it that way. So if you need to let somebody mass upload photos through the data browser, there's an easy couple clicks way to do it. Another cool feature that we released about a year ago is the ability to run custom app code on Parse. 
Now, we allow you to do this in JavaScript, and we call it cloud code. You can run, when you can run custom code when objects are saved or deleted, or you can create custom webhooks. Say you want to uh, run code when somebody saves a particular type of object with a particular value. You can set that up to be a special webhook. You can also schedule long-running jobs. So cloud code is meant to be for short, uh, small operations. But if you need to run anything long-term, like a user migration, that belongs in a background job. Along with cloud code, we also offer the ability to easily integrate with third-party services. So we have a few pre-built pre cloud modules, we call them, that allow you to do things like send email with partners like Mailgun, MailChimp, SendGrid, or take payments with Stripe, or add SMS to your app with Twilio. But ParseCloud also offers a class called ParseHTTP request, which means that you can interact with any RESTful API from cloud code that you choose to build yourself. We have a few of these cloud modules pre-built, and you can see them up on our, on our docs. But you can interact with virtually any service if you so choose. The final thing we have as part of cloud code is background jobs. And background jobs are for long-running jobs that might take a while to complete. So they have a timeout of 15 minutes. And they're for operations that need to be performed regularly or on command. And you can trigger it either using a, a web UI that I'll show you in a few minutes or with a call to a REST endpoint at parses API slash jobs. So if you don't know when you'll need to run this background job, but you want to be able to trigger it on command, you can do that relatively easily. And what does that look like? Well, in parses cloud code, you can define a, a class called a parse job, give it a name. In this case, we're lower casing all the things, and then, and then call a function. So this, this particular job is going to take in all of the users of my app and lowercase all of their names. I don't like camel case or uppercase letters for some reason. So I can query for all my users. And there's a line here that says parse cloud use master key. In parse, only a user can modify their own data, or the super user can. And the super user is you with the master key. The master key is only available in cloud code. You can't use it from the client, because obviously you could wreak havoc that way if you let people have, have the master key on the client. But once you've called that, you can actually modify user data from cloud code. So we queried for all our users, and we're going to iterate through that list and just save their name as their name lowercase. After that, we are calling either uh, status success or status error to let Parse know that the function either completed successfully or with an error. If you forget to add these lines, your code will still run, but you won't know for certain in your logs whether or not the job failed or succeeded. So remember to add in status success or status error. And I'm going to actually jump back to the laptop, if I can, to show you what this looks like. So in our cloud code for the F8 developer app, we have a cloud job that's called send survey message after session. So we want this to run regularly and send people a push notification with the survey after the sessions have run. So you can see that we've defined this here, and it's visible in our file browser. And then we can go to schedule jobs and see that there are a few jobs here that are scheduled. Now, I can click schedule a job to schedule a new one. Ah, all of them are already scheduled. But <laughs> we can take a look at some of these. Here you can see that we're going to be running a job to update surveys in people's apps or update users. And you can decide to either run them right now or edit the time at which they run in the future. And you can do that all through the web UI or on your own by calling the REST API endpoint. Can you switch back to my slides, please? Great. The other thing that Parse Core offers that makes it really easy to build apps quickly is easy user management. So most apps need to have some concept of a user. And it's pretty much a royal pain to build in a sign up and login system. That's why a lot of people use Facebook login for easy third party auth. But Parse makes it even easier to build your own system if you so desire. So with Parse user, you can sign people up, log them in, or add third party off like Facebook or Twitter. Or uh, you can add GitHub if you want. We have tools for adding pretty much any third party authenticator. And then once you've logged somebody in, you can manage their session with a concept we call Parse user, current user. There's the idea of the current user in a session. Once you've got a user, you can use them to create roles 
So for example, if you have a blogging application where you want admins to be able to remove content, but only users to be able can remove their own content, you can create those using roles and using parse users. Once you have created roles and you have some concept of users, you can also lock down object level security with ACLs. And Brian's going to talk about that a little bit more in detail in the next talk. But it's an easy way to improve security. So the API for signing up a user is really, really simple. It looks a lot like, signing, or like creating a parse object. You can see instead of calling parse object, you're saying parse user create. You're giving it a couple of attributes. In this case, username and password are both required. Email is not, but you can choose to add it at sign up. And then once you have those fields set, you can call sign up in background. Later, when you want to log somebody in, you call login in background with their username and password and a callback. And we'll let you know whether the, the login succeeded or failed. And we handle all the errors around if usernames are already taken or if you're trying to uh, validate that people are adding incorrect passwords. And we can also handle if people want to have a password reset. We have a system for that so you don't have to write that yourself. Now, the cool thing about having a current user in Parse is that once you have one, things look a little bit different. When you save a new object, let's say we have a blog post here. We'll call it Parse Object Post. We'll put in title, author, topic. And then we'll call Save in Background. Now that we have this current user, there is an ACL on the object which defaults to public read and write only by the user that created it without you having to do anything associating the post with the, with the author object. You can set a global default ACL. And then once you save it up to Parse, uh, you don't actually have to individually set things as people create new objects. It's automatically saved for you. And the great thing about that, too, is on the flip side, when you're writing a Parse query, if you write a query for posts, the only things that will be returned from the Parse query are the things that this user has permission to see. And you don't need to do anything to make that happen except have a current Parse user session. So that's pretty cool. It's a bunch of logic that you don't have to write. And another small but important way that Parse makes it just easier and easier to build your apps faster. The next component of Parse is Parse Push. And one thing that's important to know is that Parse Core, Parse Push, and Parse Analytics are three totally different products. If you have a back-end solution and everything that I've just talked about is not relevant for you, it doesn't mean you can't use Parse Push. It doesn't mean you can't use Parse Analytics. So you can pick a la carte what is going to make your life easiest to use and not be locked into any of the other things. So let's talk about push notifications. In Parse, they're based off the concept of an installation. And this is the one kind of tricky part that I want everybody to understand. An installation is the pairing between one device and one install of your app. That saves an installation object in Parse. And pushes are sent to installations. So one user may have multiple installations associated with their account. If I have an iPhone and I also have an Android tablet, I may have your app on both of those devices. And you might want to push to me just once. You might want to push to me on every device. But you probably want to keep track of which devices belong to me. So you can do that by adding a relationship between the installation object and the user object. And the great thing that that's going to enable later is advanced targeting querying. So how does that work? There are two ways that you can target pushes in Parse. One is through channels, and one is through pushing to queries. Channels are for stable interest groups. Like, say you are, have a bunch of users who are interested in hearing about news about a sports team. You're relatively certain that if I'm a Yankees fan today, I'm not going to change my fan mind and become a Red Sox fan tomorrow. So you can subscribe people to this channel and be relatively certain that they want to hear these pushes over and over again. Now, if you don't know, a priori, who is going to be interested in seeing this push. You want to target to people who are in an ad hoc group, like say you have a chat application and you don't know ahead of time who's going to be included in the chat or excluded in the chat. Then you should push to a query instead. In order to push to a query, the class you're querying on has to be pointed to from the installation object at some point, which is why we recommend that you save a pointer from the installation to the user, because that's often the class that people are interested in keeping track of. So what does this look like? Pushing to a channel looks remarkably similar to saving and creating an object. You'll create a new parse push, set a channel, set a message, and call send in background. Super easy. And you can also send these from the, the uh, push console. Can we switch to my laptop? 
the push console makes it very easy to send pushes, not from code, but just right here from this web UI. So I can click Send a Push. And in fact, I have authorization to send a push right now. I'm going to send it to everyone, all 2,020 people. And I'm going to compose a message saying, shirts are now available for uh, at the vendor. Uh, let's say, come get your F8 shirts. F8 shirts at the vending machines near the front. And you can see here that I can preview what it's going to look like. This is on an iOS device. And I can see what it's going to look like when people get the notification in their status bar and what it's going to look like if they're in another app. I can also toggle to Android so I can see what those same views would look like on an Android device. Now, if I'm satisfied that this is going to appear well, I can schedule it. And I can either schedule it to send right now or at some time in the future. And if I choose to send it at some specific time in the future, I can click this handy little button here that says, send this push in each user's respective time zone. And this is a big deal if you're running any sort of marketing campaign that uses push. If I have users in China and I have users in the US, I don't necessarily want to send them all pushes at the same time, because I might be waking somebody up at 3 o'clock in the morning. So what you can do is, with one click, easily send to people at the correct time for their time zone. But we're doing it live. So we're going to say, send now. And those of you who have the app should get a notification shortly. Right now, it's in progress. So we'll take a second and watch. Can we switch back to the slides, please? Oh, this is my slide. <laughs> now, for more advanced targeting, you may want to push to the results of a query. And the way you do that is first you set up an installation query. And you want to find uh, people who have, uh, have a badge ID equals true. Now, in the case of the F8 app, there are lots of people who signed up and downloaded the app because we made it open to everybody. But a lot of people don't actually have a badge for the conference. So we don't want to send people a bunch of spammy pushes if they're not physically here. So let's say we want to only push to people who have a badge ID. Then we can define a new parse push, set the query to be the installations that have a badge ID, send a message that says, welcome to F8, and send in background. It's really just as simple in, in this code as it is to set a channel. And we'll only send pushes to the people who have badges and are physically here. Now, the interesting thing about the past two examples that I've shown you is that they've all been examples of pushing from an Android client, which is probably something that you don't actually want to do in a production app. So what might you want to do to trigger a push from code? Well, say, for example, you have an app that matches people who are interested in doing the same thing and are physically near each other. Like, let's say I want to go play chess right now, and I'm looking for a partner. Now, I could save a partner request to the app. And when that partner request goes through, you might want to send a push notification to people who are near me saying, somebody is interested in playing chess. Are you interested in playing chess? Oh, you got the push notification? Great. Awesome. Um, so what we'll do is we'll do a fancy combination of cloud code for the after save on a partner request. And we'll also add in a push notification. So we glossed over it briefly, but an after save is one of those web hooks that you can add in Parse's cloud code that will let you run custom code after an object is saved. So in this case, we want to run some custom code after a partner request is saved. So we'll define an after save function, call it partner request, and find users near a given location. So in the request parameters, we've passed in the location of the current user who who made the partner request. Then we can find as devices associated with the users who are, with it, who are near that location with a second request. We're setting up the query. And then we can send the push notification to that query from cloud code, just like this. We'll create the parse push, just like we did in the Android code, set the data with the alert, and then call success or error. And that will send a push notification every time I upload a new partner request to people who are within a mile of me. Now, that's been push notifications. And the last thing that we talked about today that we are announcing great things around is parse analytics. 
Parse Analytics, again, like Parse Push and Parse Core, is a separate product that you can use all on your own, if you, all on its own, if you'd prefer. And it does a few things for you. You can measure app usage, like API calls and burst rates and people's responses to push notifications. And there's a lot that you get right out of the box. If you're using Parse Core, then without having to do anything extra, you'll get information on how people are using your app. Can we switch over to my laptop again? Since the F8 app uses Parse Core, without having to explicitly track any information about any of these objects that we're saving, I already know that uh, we had a sudden spike in installations about two days ago. I can't imagine why. It's because we released the app on the App Store that day. But we can also drill down a little bit further if we're interested in. We can change this view to look at weekly active installations or monthly active installations. And we can look at other classes, too. Like if we're interested in checking out a custom breakdown, we can overlay these graphs and see that the daily active installations as compared to the weekly active installations look something like this. We can also look at the retention data. And this is something that Ilya showed in the keynote. But here we can see that the percentage of active users certain days after sign up was kind of iffy in here. And that's because we had a lot of people testing the app and maybe discarding. And now we have data from people who are actually using the app live. One other thing that's important to note is the performance section here. This will show you how your app is performing, the number of requests it's consuming, and how that relates to your current burst limit. So right now, you can see that with everybody who's on the F8 app, we're running in the range of about 15 requests per second at our peaks. That means that we could operate the F8 app on the free tier on Parse if we had so chosen, which is pretty awesome because we have several thousand people using the app right now, and it wouldn't cost us a thing. The great thing about this, too, is that you can monitor how you're doing with respect to your burst limit, and that relates to our new pricing. But can we hop back to my slides for, for the time being? So those are the kinds of pieces of data that you get out of the box if you're using Parse Core. But many of you will not be using Parse Core in your apps, and that's totally fine. What you can do is you can track custom events using Parse's analytics tool. So a custom event looks like a freeform event with a set of dimensions. And you can have up to four dimensions on an event. And these dimensions have to be strings. So what does that look like in practice? Well, suppose we're looking to track people's signups. Along with signing up, we're interested in finding out the gender of the person who signed up, their referral source, whether they have friends using the app, and whether their sign up was a direct referral. So we can create this event, call it sign up, package up all these dimensions in a map, and then save it to Parse using the call Parse Analytics Track Event. And as with all calls to Parse, you don't have to worry about networking, about threading, about enqueuing things in the task. You just have to call track event. A good thing to see here is that there are some extra dimensions that we're saving. Uh, we made the decision to bucket the number of friends using the app. If we had saved individually, every time I have you know, 35 friends using the app, 36 friends using the app, that's not necessarily meaningful when it comes to segmenting your data. When you think about the kinds of things that you're tracking with Parse Analytics, four might not seem like a lot, but you have to think about how you're going to be bucketing and segmenting that data later, analyzing it to make cool decisions. So after you've saved all that data, it's visible in the data browser here. In this case, we had an app for another event where we had a photo contest. And people could would receive a push notification and would take a photo of whatever it was they were doing right at that minute and upload it to Parse. And then people could vote on what photo was their favorite of what people were doing in a particular instant of the day. Now, we wanted to track whether there was any difference in the number of responses we got between weekdays and weekends, or whether it mattered by people's country. So what we did is we had a custom event that we called contest response, and we tracked the day of the week and the country. And now, once all that data was in Parse, we could start looking at these views where we could filter out whether or not people had responded on a weekend or a weekday, and we could toggle on and off by country. So you get these rich graphs back that give you infor insights into how people are using your app live in the wild. And the point of custom events is really to get at that knowledge that makes you able to improve your app. 
It's not useful to track all these analytics if you're not actually going to use it later. So you can answer questions like, is the first level of my game too hard? When I add like, a different constant for gravity, do people think that it's totally crazy and quit the app after, after one try? Or are people not completing purchases in my app for one reason or another? Or you might want to know answers to questions like, how successful was our last push campaign? And these are all things that you can track inside Parse Analytics. Now, these are the three different parts of Parse that you all can choose to use a la carte to suit your needs and get building faster. It makes it really easy to get up and running with an iOS app, with an Android app, with .NET uh, and the Windows 8 phone apps, if you guys are building those as well, and get running really quickly. And we just released our new pricing. So for those of you who might not have known what Parse was when we were talking about it in the keynote, hopefully this makes it a little bit clearer what exactly our pricing structure is. So if you're using Parse Core, you have unlimited API calls to Parse within a certain burst limit. And you can monitor your burst limit using the tool that I showed you before. So that means that you can make as many calls to parse as you want. And as long as you're not hitting us all at all the same time, you, you won't even need to pay. And we give you 30 requests per second out of the box for free. And every 10 requests per second after that is an extra $100 up to a certain limit. And then after that, you can contact our sales team if you're interested in an enterprise contract. Now, for parse push, you can have unlimited pushes for up to a million subscribers. That doesn't mean a million pushes per month. That means if I have a million users, I can push to them as many times in a month as I want before I'm getting charged, which is a lot of push notifications if you're using them. Parse Analytics is just unlimited, free, 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 100%. So that makes it a very easy and inexpensive way to add analytics to your app and get data into what your users are actually doing and how you can improve app experience for everyone. So how you get started, you can go to parse.com and download one of our SDKs, or you can just get started with our Quick Start in our Quick Start section. And luckily, we have some time for questions. So I'm happy to take anybody's questions if you have them about Parse Core, Parse Analytics, or Parse Push. Hi. Hi. Um, on the parts analytics, uh, I just wanted to check, uh, is it uh, COPA compliant? COPA compliant. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I assume so, but I, do you know? I don't know. For you know, kids? Uh... Oh, oh, for kids. Oh, I believe so. Okay. But I'd have to check on that for you. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, online privacy. Yeah. going to run to the back. <laughs> Shall we take that first? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, can you talk about I integration with existing users or existing databases? Uh, sure. So if you need to mi do you mean you want to integrate, or do you mean you want to migrate to Parse? Like if I have a website with mm -hmm. current users and yeah. I want to launch a Parse app, how, how do I tie those two sides together? Well, you can run a migration where you would basically take all of the user accounts in your existing website and create a matching parse user on our system so that session on parse could be linked to their session or their user data in your existing app. And you can do that probably best with a script and calls to our REST API to create user accounts. It's probably the cleanest way to do it. Is that enough of an answer to your question? If, you, if you'd like more detail, that's probably something that's best handled one-to-one, -one, and I'm happy to talk to you about it. It's hard to give a general solution for that. Question here. Yeah. Hi. When QAing um, an, an app in development and working with the test with the uh, desktop browser directly mm -hmm. in the fields, is there a preferred browser? Because I notice when deleting or messing with information, whether it's Firefox or Safari, the nuances can be slightly, I mean, like with any website, slightly different. But do you guys prefer a website? We don't. We, we work on supporting uh, Chrome, all the major browsers, so Chrome, Safari, Firefox, and IE. Uh, we do support IE as well. <laughs> we don't have a particular preference. But if you do see a bug, please do report it to us. OK. Question. Hi. Uh, I have a question about pass and uh, push notification. Okay. Like you, you know, for in Android, 
those notifications are customizable, like show an icon and show different action. Can I like customize this using pass? And um, the second question is, um, for different notifications, sometimes we wanna bring different notifications to different page inside my app. Mm -hmm. How can I do that over using um, pass? Sure. So we recently began to support GCM. Until recently, parse push uh, on Android was our own in-house system. And that means that even now, if you want to push to non-GCM devices like a Kindle Fire, for example, you can do that using parse. Now, things like customizing the notifications is something that's done through GCM. And certain features of that are now available, available in parse, yes. The way to uh, handle content being passed in is to add that content in the in the message of your app, in the message of your push notification that's being sent. And then within your app, you can handle that with a custom broadcast receiver that will pull out that extra data and direct somebody to the content in your app. Fair question, Downright. Hello. Hey, uh, uh, I just wanted to know what kind of relations are supported between different data objects in Parse? Sure, so we can either, in Parse, when you're trying to manage relationships between two objects, there are a few ways to think about it. You might have a relationship that needs to be one-to-one -one with objects, and in that case, your best bet is to just have a pointer. Either you might have a one-to-many relationship, in which case you probably want to have an ar array of pointers. Or there might be a many-to-many -many relationship, which you can handle either using a parse relation, which is uh, similar to a join table conceptually, um, or an actual join table if you have a bunch of metadata that you want to store on the relation. So for example, if you have a follow follower relationship that you're maintaining in your social app, you might want to also have information about that follower relationship that says, you know, this person followed this person on this date. And so in that case, you'd want to use a join table. We have a great guide in our docs section called the relations guide, and that will walk you through how to choose the best, the best uh, relationship model for two objects in your app. Question here. Um, does parse push uh, support push notifications to browsers? No, not yet. And uh, I have a second question. Hmm. Um, if I'm using the uh, JavaScript SDK, yeah. uh, is there a way to uh, encrypt passwords that I save on the client for reauth? Uh, not automatically built into parse, but yes, you can definitely do that. All right, one more. Do you have any profiling tools available? So for running a job on in the cloud and we are getting failures or we're seeing bad performance or we're getting, you know, we're something's not optimized correctly. Is there mm -hmm. some way for us to dive deeper into what's going on there? So that's something that we know is a major concern for developers right now, and we're working on improving tooling all around that to make it a lot easier to dig down into what might be causing performance issues. Uh, in the meantime, your best bets are to do logging in all of your cloud jobs to see what exactly might be going wrong. And a couple of tools like the, the uh, first request tool might give you some insight to that as well. If you see that there's a certain spike in requests in your app, or if you notice that uh, you're, you're getting to a size where your queries might be starting to hit the three-second timeout limit in cloud code, that's, that's some things that might be a good indicator for why, why things are slowing down. But improved tooling is definitely something that's on our radar. OK, thanks. Any more questions? Oh, one more. just curious, with the new pricing model, are you guys going to allow custom domains on the free product, or is that still going to be a paid thing? That is a good question. I don't actually know the answer, but I can look it up and find out for you. Thank you. You can come meet me after. All right. Thank you, Bear. Well, thank you, guys. Oh, my God, it's so hot. <laughs>